Good morning, church. Uh, I feel good this morning. I don't know uh, if it's the cool air, the Holy Spirit, or the fact that my wife stayed up and changed the baby's diapers all night and I got to sleep. But uh, praise God, we're here and we're going to worship our Father in heaven and his son Jesus Christ this morning. Amen. I'm going to pray real quick and then uh, we'll open the word of God. This thing's a little crooked. Father, we thank you uh, that we get to come to this field and sit in this circle uh, and worship you. I thank you that you sent your son uh, to walk a path of righteousness and perfection on earth uh, so that he could mediate between us and you. We thank you that you restore us uh, to your righteousness. You cover us with your holiness Father, I pray that your words would be spoken, not man's, this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, who, raise your hand if you're here, if you are preparing your list of New Year's resolutions. Raise your hand. I know it's cold, but take them out of your pocket for a second. Uh, it's, it's that time of year where we begin to reflect on our lives and, and make some evaluations. And many of us year after year, I don't know if you're like me, come up with a long list of things that we're not going to do ever again or things that we're going to start doing forever starting January 1st. And um, I never follow them. I'm sorry. Let's be honest. You probably don't do either, so I don't feel bad. Uh, So this morning, I want to look at God's Word. We're going to turn to Genesis chapter 15 to start. Yeah, we're going to look at how God creates something new in his body, in his church. And so we're going to start in Genesis chapter 15, starting in verse 8. This is a story that picks up after God has promised Abraham and his wife uh, that they will have a son, and uh, they're old, and they don't believe that they can have children. And God promises them, you will have Descendants so numerous that they will be as numerous as the stars in the sky. And, uh, you know, if you're like Abraham, you might be a little skeptical. Sarah actually laughed. (laughs) She said, what? And the angel of the Lord says, why are you laughing at me? She says, I didn't laugh. But she laughed. And so the promised son uh, would be named Isaac, who actually means laughter. He laughs. And so this picks up in a conversation that Abraham is having with uh, the angel of the Lord, with God. It says in verse 8, Abraham replied, O sovereign Lord, how can I be sure that I will actually possess it? Referring to the land, the promised land. Verse 9, the Lord told him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. So Abram presented these to him and killed them. Then he cut each animal down the middle and laid the halves side by side. He did not, however, cut the birds in half. Some vultures swooped down to eat the carcasses, but Adam chased them away. Now that may sound like a strange beginning to an agreement that God has with his people. And so I want to give you a little background on that. Who has bought a car or a house, or sign a contract, right? If you're younger, you probably sign something to get a cell phone, or maybe you're still using your parents' account. I don't know. And typically, you have two parties in an agreement, and both parties would sign a piece of paper that say, uh, if I don't honor my half, these are the consequences. If you don't honor your half, these are the consequences. And so this ceremony that Abraham is preparing for is similar. It's an oath. It's a covenant agreement, a process of creating a covenant. And in Old Testament times, you would cut up these animals and you would put some on this side and some on that side. And both parties would enter into an agreement and they would walk down the aisle, not the aisle of marriage, but they would walk down the aisle of death and destruction. And uh, there's a fancy term for this. It's called a self-maledictory oath. 
say that self-maledictory, right? If you want to confuse your children, you could use that in your uh, dinner conversation this evening. And essentially, they would say, if I don't follow my end of the agreement, the same thing that happened to these animals will happen to me. And so they were making an agreement and pledging that uh, unto death they would honor their agreement. And so this is the stage that is set, and something interesting happens in the next few verses. Verse 12, as the sun was going down, Abraham fell into a deep sleep, and a terrifying darkness came down over him. Then the Lord said to Abram, you can be sure that your descendants will be strangers in a foreign land where they will be oppressed as slaves for 400 years. Doesn't sound very promising. Verse 14, but I will punish the nation that enslaves them, and in the end, they will come away with great wealth. That sounds a little better. As for you, you will die in peace and be buried at a ripe old age. After four generations, your descendants will return here to this land. For the sins of the Amorites do not yet warrant their destruction. God makes this pledge and tells them, Eventually, your descendants, after four generations, will come back here, and they will inhabit the very land that he is standing in. Verse 17. After the sun went down and darkness fell, Abraham saw a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch pass between the halves of the carcasses. So the Lord made a covenant with Abram that day and said, I have given this land to your descendants all the way from the border of Egypt to the great Euphrates River. Now, in our culture and in an English translation, it's easy to miss uh, a part of this story. Only one person walked through the halves of the carcasses. It says that the flaming pot and the fire passed through the carcasses. Now, that language, that that. Uh, terminology is the terminology that Old Testament writers use over and over again to refer to God the Father or uh, the angel of the Lord, and New Testament writers pick up that same language to talk about the character of Jesus Christ. And so this is a covenant, an agreement signed by one party. One party, God the Father, passes through and says, I will honor my commitment to you, the end. Now, I don't know about you, but if you signed a, uh, a home loan or a car loan and they said, don't worry about it, we'll go ahead and just take care of it. If, if you mess up, if you miss your payments, I got you covered, right? But that's essentially what God is saying to the people. He is saying to Abram, my covenant, my commitment to you I make, and I will honor because I alone have the power to do that. He understands that we are a flawed, broken people, and he doesn't make his blessing on us and his plan contingent on our success, on our merit, on our goodness. His promise to his chosen people and to the world and to the nations that will be blessed by Abraham is contingent solely on his goodness. Let's flip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. There are many covenants in the Old Testament uh, that build on this covenant that God made with Abraham. Moses, after he takes the people out of Egypt, he goes to Mount Sinai and uh, God renews that covenant with him. And uh, generation after generation after generation, God re continues to renew the covenant. Until we get to Jesus Christ in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm going to read 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 23. If you're here on uh, the first Sunday of the month, you've probably heard this verse before. This is the communion passage that's often uh, quoted to talk about the act of communion, and it says in verse 23, For I pass on to you what I receive from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. 
Then he broke it into pieces and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. For every time you drink this bread and drink this cup, eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. There was a prophet, Jeremiah, after the nation of Babylon, the nation of Israel was carried away into Babylon that prophesied that there will be a day that God creates a new covenant and begins something new with his people. And that prophecy is fulfilled in Jesus Christ, and he begins a new relationship, not just with the chosen nation of Israel, but with the Gentiles as well. He opens up his family to all people who will accept Jesus Christ and act on faith in him as their savior. And it says that this new agreement, like the first agreement, is signed not by us, not by our merit, but by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so he begins something new in his death and his resurrection. And so many people ask, well, what's, how do we make sense of these two covenants? This Old Testament covenant with the nation of Israel and the New Testament covenant with Jesus Christ. And so we're going to look at that for a few minutes this morning in uh, the book of Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews 12, verse 18. You have not come to a physical mountain, to a place of flaming fire, darkness, gloom, whirlwind, and whirlwind, as the Israelites did at Mount Sinai. For they heard an awesome trumpet blast and a voice so terrible, they begged God to stop speaking. They staggered back under God's command, if even an animal touches the mountain... It must be stoned to death. Moses himself was so frightened at the sight that he said, I am terrified and trembling. When God reconfirmed the covenant with Moses after he carried the nation of Israel out of captivity, they came to a mountain and the spirit of God descended on this mountain and it was dark and there was clouds and there was thunder. And the people were terrified and there was actually a moment where the people said to Moses, uh, you go talk to God. I'm too scared. It'll destroy us if we have to stand before God's presence. And so Moses goes up to the mountain through the storm, through the wind and the thunder and the lightning. And God in his own hand carves out the 10 commandments and sends them back down with Moses. And the nation of Israel was terrified, but that was the covenant that he made with them that they would walk out for 40 years in the wilderness and into the promised land. But Paul, or the author of Hebrews, says that this is not the circumstance that you and I are in today. In verse 22, it says, No, you have come to a mount, to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to countless thousands of angels in a joyful gathering. You have come to the assembly of God's firstborn children, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God himself, who is the judge over all things. You have come to the spirits of righteous, the righteous ones in heaven, who have now been made perfect. You have come to Jesus, the one who mediates the new covenant between God and people, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks of forgiveness instead of crying out, for vengeance like the blood of Abel. We've been given a new relationship, a new opportunity not to stand in fear, not to uh, stand in terror of God our Father who is righteous and who is just and who will judge the world. But we get to stand in freedom. We get to stand in peace. We get to stand reconciled to God the Father Because that man, Jesus Christ, who came, he mediates the new covenant. It is his blood. It is his sacrifice that allows us to enter into this new agreement with our Father. No longer are we cut 
out of uh, the presence of God. Through Jesus Christ, when God banished Abraham or Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden and says, no longer can you stand in my presence, Jesus comes and says, through me, I will bring you back into the presence of God. I will reconcile you to God the Father. And he says something more. He says, it doesn't depend on you. He says, you are not able to reconcile yourself. In Ephesians, it says that salvation is a gift from God. It's not anything that we earn, and we can't take credit for it. We can't boast about it. It is solely by the goodness of God that we are able to be reunited to God the Father. And so the question I have this morning for us is, how does this affect us as we begin to walk into a new year? How many of you are ready for 2020 to be over? Uh, <laughs> I'm ready too. How many of you are just as terrified of 2021? Right, let's be honest. We still have a lot of uncertainty. And so many of us, I think, are asking the questions of how could I be more certain in the next year? How can I be more confident? How can I protect my family? How can I raise my children and minister uh, to my family in the situation that we are walking into in the coming year? And so I have bad news and good news. I'll start with the bad news. And in and of ourselves, we are unable to do anything to make our lives better this coming year. If you're like me, you're going to say, I'm going to exercise three times a week. I'm not going to eat sugar anymore. I'm going to quit drinking all the caffeine that keeps me up at night to take care of a baby. Uh, and I'll, I'm just going to take care of myself. And then we're going to walk into the same pain, the same confusion, the same dark world. And we're going to be overcome Because by our own rules, by our own abilities, we don't have any power to affect real change. And so turn with me to Colossians chapter 2, where Paul explains this, uh, this conundrum that we seem to find ourselves in year after year. And Colossians 2, the end of the chapter, starting in verse 20. He says, you have died with Christ, and he has set you free from the spiritual powers of this world. So why do you keep on following the rules of this world, such as don't handle, don't taste, don't touch? Such rules are mere human teachings about things that deteriorate as we use them. These rules may seem wise because they require strong devotion, pious self-denial, and severe bodily discipline. Paul says that all of the rules that we place on ourselves to try to be righteous, to try to be holy, to try to earn the salvation and grace of our Father in heaven, he says on the outside, it looks like they might help, right? All of our New Year's rev resolutions and all of the other resolutions that we make throughout the year are agreements that we are making with ourselves, right? We're walking through... The, the covenant of the pieces alone with ourselves, and uh, that's a bad situation because we will inevitably fail ourselves. And Paul makes an interesting point. He says that these rules seem wise because they require strong devotion, pious self-denial, and severe bodily discipline, but they provide no help in conquering a person's evil desires. The reason that I eat too much or drink too much caffeine or stay up too late or insert X isn't because I don't have enough rules in my life. It isn't because I haven't figured out the right formula. It's because there's a problem with my heart. I'm selfish and greedy and prideful. And I think about me and I don't think about you. And I put myself first because there is a condition of my heart that is broken. And Paul points out that I could follow all the rules in the world and my heart could still be broken. We're fostering a young boy in, in uh, grade school 
and we've quickly realized on Zoom that he can follow all the rules of Zoom. There's this list of Zoom etiquette. He could look at the screen all day long. He could put an answer in every box on the assignment, and he can still hate his teacher. He could still be miserable. He can still loathe me for making him do his work, right? Because it's not about following rules. His problem isn't that he can't follow the rules. His problem is he doesn't understand the value of education, right? His problem is that he's looking at education from a self-centered perspective of I'm doing this instead of playing Minecraft or Roblox or whatever it is that we do online. And the same is true with you and me. We come with a broken heart. And so where does that leave us? Hopeless and despair? No. Because even though there's bad news, there is good news. Paul goes on in chapter 3 and he says this. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, revealed, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in his glory. So put to death sinful earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. You used to do these things when your life was still part of this world, but now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds." This sounds like a laundry list of my New Year's resolutions, all of the things that I've struggled with in my life. And Paul doesn't say, it's hopeless, you can't change. No, he says that there is hope, and this is how we accomplish that change. In verse 10, he says, put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. In this new life, it doesn't matter if you are a Jew or a Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slaved, or free. Christ is all that matters, and he lives in all of us. We can't change ourselves, but we can die to ourselves, and we can put on the new nature of Jesus Christ and he says that as we learn to know our God, we will be given the ability to change. And so I have this encouragement for us this morning as we walk into a new year of uncertainty. Instead of trying to change ourselves, we can trust in the unchanging nature of God. Because the Bible says that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That promise that he made with Abraham wasn't contingent on Abraham's ability to fulfill the promise. If our salvation was determined by our merit, we would all burn in hell. There would be no hope and there would be no salvation. But generation after generation... God renews his covenant with the people and says, I will raise up a remnant. I will save a people to worship me and to honor me and to glorify me based on his goodness, based on his righteousness. There is good news. Even though we may not be able to keep our commitments to ourselves, God will keep his commitment to us. The Bible promises this, God will make you new. 
if you are willing to die to yourself. In this scripture, Paul points out, you died to this life and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. Rather than trying to change ourselves, we need to let ourselves go. And we need to look not to the physical things, not to the worldly things, not to elections or economics or militaries, but we need to look to heavenly things, to eternal things, because in that is where our true nature is. As we shed our earthly selves, as we shed our laundry list of things that Paul addresses here, we can begin to know who God is. And as we begin to know who God is, it will make us new. In Romans, Paul talks about how the condition of humanity, the fallen nature of humanity, the confusion of humanity comes from one thing. It comes from a people denying who God is and not giving him credit. And it says because of that, we were given up to confused minds and dark minds. And so this morning, as we walk into a new year, I pray that we would not be consumed with all of the things that cause anxiety, that we would not be consumed with trying to change our immediate circumstances. We would not be consumed with the uncertainty of our finances, the uncertainty of health, or the uncertainty of our government, but that we would be able to remain focused with our eyes fixed on Jesus because he is the author and perfecter of our faith. And he alone has the power to save, and he alone has the power to heal, and he loves you, and he is calling you to be that new creation by his power. I get the band to come back. We're going to take some time this morning and pray. If you're watching on YouTube, there's a... Uh, a chat box, and we have some people monitoring that. And if you have a prayer request this morning, please uh, throw that in the chat box, or you could go to our website, uh, livingwatereg.com, and find our email address, and you could send us a message. We want to pray with you, and we want to encourage you as well. If you're here this morning, and you're afraid and uncertain, we want to pray for you. We want to pray with you. I would encourage you this morning to take all of the things that you want to change about yourself, that you want to change about your life, that you want to change about the world, and instead of making an agreement with man, with yourself, accept the new covenant of Jesus Christ. Allow his eternal and unfailing and unchanging covenant to give you strength and courage and meaning in this difficult time. Father, I thank you that you gave us a perfect high priest, Jesus Christ. I thank you that as we celebrated this week, he chose to come and dwell among us. That he lived a life in a sinful fallen world as the perfect sacrifice for our sins. I thank you that he shed his blood so that no longer will I have to stand outside of the presence of God the Father. I thank you that I now get to cry out, Abba, Daddy, come save me. I want to sit in your presence. I want to sit in your safety and your security. And I want to trust this morning that you have the power to heal, that you have the power to protect, that you have the power to change and to give new life through your son, Jesus Christ. We love you, Father. We thank you for the sacrifice of your son. We surrender our lives to you this morning, and we make a conscious choice to trust in you rather than ourselves this new year. In Jesus' name, amen.